we discussed in an earlier lesson how math can be used to describe um, things in science in a more uh, specific way. Uh, in a lab that you may have performed in class, you were asked to measure the wavelength and frequency uh, of a wave on a slinky and compare that to the speed of the wave. Um, and it's a difficult lab to get to be done perfect to get a, a exactly the right answer you should, uh, but you will probably see something close to the idea that the speed of the wave, V, is equal to the product of the frequency and the wavelength. When V is measured in meters per second, F is measured in hertz, and lambda is measured in meters. Remember that what a hertz is is a cycle per second, so it's basically one over seconds, or sometimes written as seconds to the negative one. So if we look at the units for frequency, it's one over second. For wavelength, it's meters. So when you combine that, you get meters over second, which is a unit of speed. So this equation here is a really important one in uh, when dealing with waves and we can, so much so that we just call it the wave equation v equals f lambda so uh, there are a few examples of, of this and how it, how it pertains to light uh, the first example we're going to look at is actually more of an example uh, with sound so let's say we have a sound wave um, at moving at 340 meters per second, which is typical speed for a sound wave in air. Um, and if we play a note on a piano, it has a frequency of 440 hertz. What is the wavelength of that note? Um, you may have seen this, hopefully you did, in grade nine when doing uh, word problems in electricity, that whenever you're doing a word problem, it's not sufficient to just uh, plug some things into your calculator and just come up with a number. We want to follow some sort of a process so when the questions become more difficult and and they very well could depending on where you go from here um, that you have some sort of a, a, a habit a pattern that you can fall back on to help you solve more difficult questions and so you may have seen the uh, either guess uh, format or the grasp format uh, given unknown equation solve and a sentence or given required analyze solve and paraphrase they all basically mean the same thing you don't need to label each one of your sections but the main thing is you write down what you know and what you need to know um, so in this case we know v equals 340 meters per second you write down the other things you know, which are frequency equals 440 hertz. Um, writing those down shows some understanding of the question, even if you don't actually answer the question properly. There's a whole bunch of little things that can go, uh, that have to go right or that could go wrong in order to give you uh, a weird answer. But showing your teacher that you understand what is given to you is a big part of solving the problem so you'll be there will be some marks usually set aside for that uh, and not doing it means that you will end up losing marks what is it that we're trying to get what is the wavelength so even just doing this shows that you understand that lambda is the variable that you want to solve so we start off there's your your uh, givens and your unknowns or the given and required uh, now we go to the equation or analysis uh, and the equation that we're starting with, and you're not going to have to memorize equations for the most part. Um, it, it, it's not a memorization type of type of course. Um, we want to show that we can use it. It does no good for a carpenter to memorize what a hammer looks like if the carpenter can't use the hammer. So we want to see that you can use it. So we'll give you the equation, V equals F lambda, and then we want to see that you can use it. So in this case, Using it means rearranging the equation because we want lambda. So we're going to divide both sides by frequency. So the frequency cancels out and you end up with lambda by itself on the right hand side. And on the left, you end up with V over F. Now, if you go straight into this step right here and you don't show where the 
where the Fs are canceling, uh, that's okay as long as you make sure that you do it properly. That it has to be perfect. It can't, it, you can't, there's no way of partially doing this correctly. It's either right or it's wrong. So there's your formula. Plug your numbers in. So we know that V is equal to 340. So in brackets, 340 divided by, in brackets, 440. Uh, the brackets just show that that's a number that's been uh, given and inputted and it's not part of the equation itself. And we'll see uh, in different areas of science that we have numbers actually in the equation. So this shows the difference between an inputted number and a number that's in the equation. Now you just plug that in. 340 divided by 440, and you're going to get an answer that's a decimal, zero decimal. Uh, I'm going to go seven, seven. Now, my calculator says this. I'm going to just jot down all of these digits here. Seven, seven, two, seven, two, seven. And you could just keep doing that forever. Uh, calculator will eventually pop it off. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, well, how many, how many decimal places do we use? That's where you have to look at your answer. You have to how or your givens, I should say, and how many digits you have in your givens that are that you're sure of. So in the speed, the three and the four are digits that you're sure of. The zero might just be there to hold the place. Same thing over here. The four and the four are numbers that you're sure of. The zero might be there to hold the place. So my theory is I want you to keep the same number of digits that you have in your givens. Maybe you can use one more. So I would say this would be 0 0.7. I'm going to go with one more than the two that are given to me. I'm going to go 7, 7. And then the next one is a 2, but the digit after that is higher than a 5. So you have to make sure to round up. 27 is closer to 30 than it is to 20. So 7, 7, 3. And that's your lambda. Put it in. Put your unit in. And you could summarize this in the equation. Therefore, the wavelength. is 0 0.773 meters uh, or if you want to put it in a more common um, unit you can call that 77.3 centimeters not that centimeters is more common than meters but generally if you have less than a meter you would probably measure that in centimeters either answer is fine sometimes when you're just doing practice questions instead of taking a little extra time to write uh, write an equation i might just or write a sentence i might just uh, put a little box around it and say, yeah, that's, there's my answer. Just make it obvious that that's what your answer is. So, how does this, what does this mean for the speed of light? Well, first of all, it's really important to note that the speed of light is a constant value when it's in a vacuum um, or Air, and we're going to see a little bit later on. You'll you'll likely see later on that uh, that it does change when it's in a different material, but it changes in a very set way. We uh, we use the letter C to denote this, um, and it turns out to be about 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, uh, which is obviously a very very fast speed. And Einstein showed through his uh, theory of relativity that nothing can go faster than this speed. And in fact, nothing with any mass can even get up to this speed. But a whole bunch of really weird things happen, like mass. The mass starts to increase when you get up close to the speed of light. Uh, things get shorter. Uh, time even slows down a little bit. And that's a topic for a grade 12 physics class if you're interested in such thing. So how do you go about figuring this out because it's not like uh, we can use like a radar detector because the radars actually um, use light uh, in order to measure speed of, of other things. You're, you can't measure distance and time to get speed because it's just too fast. So how do you go about doing this? Um, I have a website attached here. A whole bunch of different ways. Galileo, even back uh, about 400 or, or so years ago, uh, just claimed that it was about 10 times faster than sound, uh, which he wasn't even close, but it did give you the idea that it was uh, a really fast speed. Uh, as little as uh, less than 30 years later, uh, somebody else said that it was about 200,000 kilometers every second. Well, just think about that. 200,000 kilometers. That's enough to go uh, around the world 
some like five times in one second. So right there, it got really, really fast. Um, and then it changed a little bit. It kind of stayed around that level, 301,000 kilometers per second, 313, 299, 299,796. Uh, and now it's, what's interesting about this number, the number that we have today is this is the only uh, number measure that in science that is an exact number that you're that you're measuring. We basically make all of our other numbers like what a meter is is based on the speed of light. So this number is exact. There is no rounding here. There is no extra digit after that eight. That is the exact number. Two hundred ninety nine thousand seven hundred and 92.458 kilometers every second. How did you go about doing about doing that? I mean, there's some weird ways. Galileo uh, tried to use lanterns and, um, and hourglasses, and in order to, you basically pulled the shade off one hourglass or one lantern, had a colleague on a hill 10 kilometers away who uh, would have been, when he saw the light, he pulled the shade off of that one and the light went back and forth between two two uh, hills and you know that that didn't work all that well as you can imagine um the most common that um and one that i did in university involved uh, mirrors and having light coming by and hitting uh, an octagonal shaped mirror and then bouncing around inside the equipment to do and a whole bunch of other things, um, actually it would hit the face kind of going sideways here. So the mirror looked like this a little bit. And it would hit this mirror and then bounce out and do a whole bunch of other things and then have to bounce here while this mirror was rotating. So if you rotate that mirror just the right amount, this side of the mirror would be over back to this point when the light bounced back. Anyway, it gets complicated and it's, uh, it's a neat little thing and it, it works. So uh, notice that there are two different measurements over here. The US says one thing, the, uh, the British say something that's a little bit different. Um, and so they kind of just split the difference a little bit and called it 299.79.458. Again, you don't have to me uh, memorize this. And just like a little while ago, we talked about uh, digits that you know and that you've measured. And we're not needing to know every single one of those digits. We rounded it up to three digits. And when we round it, it turns out to be 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Or if you were doing kilometers per second, like that last website, it would be 3.00 times 10 to the 5 kilometers per second. So now since we know that the speed of light is constant, so that's a constant value, and we know that V is equal to F times lambda. If this stays the same, then what kind of relationship exists between frequency and wavelength? Because light comes in a whole bunch of different frequencies and a whole bunch of different wavelengths. So when we look at the different types of light, it's based on their um, frequency. In turn, it also means it's based on its wavelength. Because as we talked about on the last slide, <coughs> V equals F lambda. And if F goes up, then V has to go down. So the product of F and lambda stays the same. When you multiply F times lambda, you're always going to get 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second when light is in air. <coughs> so every, every light, different type of light will have some things that are the same and some things that are different. For example, uh, the speed is the same for every different um, kind of light. And you can see at the chart at the bottom, we're talking about gamma rays, x-rays, UV or ultraviolet, infrared, radio waves as well. We kind of, we're kind of missing one here that we can write in. Microwaves, a different kind of light as well. 
So the speed is the same for every kind of light. So what's different? F and lambda are different. Um, and because of that, the energy they carry is different as well. And the ability to penetrate materials are different. So if we go down and take a look at this chart, and we've got gamma rays, which are really, really small wavelengths and really large frequencies. The larger the frequency, they don't have the frequencies um, on this particular chart, but when the wavelength gets low, the frequency gets high. Think of the wave equation like a runner. And uh, light is a really, really fast runner. Now, there's a whole bunch of different ways to run fast. You could be like Usain Bolt, where you have really, really long strides, great big wavelengths. But then the speed that he turns his feet over maybe isn't as fast as some other high-level sprinters. Uh, a shorter person might have their feet moving really, really, really fast, but their steps are, are very short. So Usain Bolt would be like a large wavelength and a small frequency. Usain Bolt a radio wave. Somebody who's really short but their feet move quickly is like a gamma ray. So these gamma rays here are very, very small wavelengths, extremely small. Um, and their frequency, therefore, is huge. And the amount of energy that you that a light ray has is dependent on its frequency. So gamma rays have huge amount of energy. It takes huge amount of energy to generate them. Generally, gamma rays are done during like nuclear bomb blasts and uh, and inside of uh, of a star or during a supernova. So they're really uncommon. X rays, on the other hand, we're re very familiar with. And again, X rays are generated by nuclear radiation. Uh, UV light, we get that from the sun. Visible light, we get that from a whole variety of places. They're kind of in the middle. Same thing with infrared light. Ev pretty much everything at, at temperatures around most of the stuff that we, that we deal with is actually emitting infrared light. And that includes you and me and the walls. We're all emitting a little bit of light and it's all in the infrared range. Microwaves, well, that's how they work. They emit microwaves and the and the device heats up water molecules by emitting waves of, of a particular uh, wavelength in kind of this range over here that overlaps a little bit into infrared, a little bit to radio waves. Radio waves themselves are very, very long wavelengths, and you can see how it stretches out quite a bit here. Like it can be as low as one centimeter, and they can actually get into the um, into the kilometers. You can have radio waves with wavelengths that are a kilometer, uh, which means that if they're, they would have a very, very low frequency since their wavelength is, is high. Um, and when we talk about penetrating, ability to penetrate, we know x-rays, for example, uh, an x-ray can get through human tissue, can get through skin and, and muscle and things like that. Uh, and we know that because when we shine x-rays at uh, like a, an arm, um, the x-rays go right through the human tissue, but they do not go through bone and cartilage and things like that. And so you could put a piece of film in back of your arm and only the light that got through will expose the film and you'll get a little picture of the bones in your arm. And that's what an x-ray machine does. Um, so we know that x-rays can go through uh, skin and muscle, uh, but they can't go through bone. Gamma rays, on the other hand, will go right through bone as well. Um, Microwaves and radio waves go through us all the time. In fact, while you're watching this, there's a good chance that you're watching it over Wi-Fi, and, and that's microwave light that's going through the walls and going through us and going through everything, and that's not an issue because they're very, very low energy light rays. We know that visible light doesn't go through us. Um, you can't like shine a flashlight through through your brain by pointing in one ear and expecting it to come out the other. So uh, the different types of radiation can be absorbed or go through materials depending on uh, what wavelength they have. And it's not necessarily the more energetic it, it is that the more likely it is to go 
to go through it. Actually, both extremes will tend to go through figures. So let's look at an example. I'd actually like you to pause the video for a second. Uh, attempt the two questions on, uh, on this page and then unpause it and come back and see how your answer compares to what I have. Okay, so if you're back, hopefully that means that you've actually tried these questions and not just left it up to me to do them for you. Um, so let's use our process again here. Light ray has a frequency of 2.5 times 10 to the 10 megahertz. So F equals 2.5 times 10 to the 10 M8, capital M. So that's a megahertz. What is its wavelength? Um, well, it looks like the only thing that we're given is this 2.5 times 10 to 10 megahertz. And if we use the formula V equals HF, not HF, sorry, uh, F lambda, then we need something else. Well, what that something else is, is the V. V is equal to the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, one of the things that you really have to watch for um, is... I'm going to move this a little bit, move this down, uh, is your units. Remember that when we looked at the wave equation, we said our frequency had to be in hertz. Well, that frequency is not in hertz. That frequency is in megahertz. So remember, a mega is 10 to the 6. So megahertz is 10 to the 6 hertz. So if we have 2.5 times 10 to the 10, and then you multiply that by 10 to the 6, we end up with 2.5 times 10 to the 16 hertz. Think of it like moving the decimal place six times from going from mega, here's your mega, kilo, and base, which is hertz in this case. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Moving your decimal place six times, uh, and you're making your number bigger because the unit is getting smaller. So, Converting your unit there, you get 2.5 times 10 to the 16 hertz. Let's rearrange our equation, just like last time, lambda is equal to V over F. Please don't bother trying to memorize all the different ways to rearrange equations. There are going to be more equations in this unit, and so memorizing every single one of them is literally just tripling, or in some cases quadrupling your work, and it doesn't really help you. So just learn how to rearrange that equation. We know our V is 3 times 10 to the 8. We know our F is 2.5 times 10 to the 16. Even if you don't have a scientific calculator. Now, if you do, you're going to want to use, uh, the, you probably have an EXP button or an EE button, and that's the button you want to use. So you would type in 3 EXP 8 to do 3 times 10 to the 8. Don't use the times 10 to the or uh, x to the y button if you don't have to. Uh, or you might have 3 e e 8. If you're not sure how to use your calculator, if you're not getting the right answer, or if you just want to confirm, please ask your teacher about it just to be on the safe side. You don't want to find out on, on test day that you don't know how to use your calculator properly. So another way of going about doing this, if you don't have a scientific calculator, you can do 3 divided by 2.5 times 10 to the 8 minus 16. 3 divided by 2.5 gives you something that's a little bit over 1, say 1 1.2 times 10 to the 8 minus 16 is negative 8. So it's 1.2 times 10 to the negative 8 meters. Uh, so what is that normally how we would talk about this, this wavelength of light? Probably not. Um, you could convert it, and that turns out to give you 12 nanometers. Now that we know it's 12 nanometers, we can go back to the last page and say, okay, 12 nanometers, oh look, there's 10 nanometers right here, so slightly bigger, so it's very, very low uh, wavelength ultraviolet light or high frequency or high energy ultraviolet light. You would not want to be getting hit with these particular type of rays when you're out um, in the sun for a day. They will cause some significant damage to your skin. Given the chart on the previous page, calculate the range of frequencies for x-rays. So the range of frequencies for x-rays 
as we see here, uh, goes from that 10 nanometers on one side to 0 0.01 nanometers on the other side. So 10 to 0 0.01 nanometers. So we have a wavelength of 10 nanometers on one side and a wavelength of 0 0.01 nanometers on the other side. So you need to do conversion. This turns out to be 1 times 10 to the negative 8 meters. This one turns out to be 1 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. We know the speed is the same on both, on both sides. V is equal to C. V is equal to C. And we want to get the frequency. Frequency. So instead of having to rearrange the equation twice, let's just do this once. And let's say uh, C equals F times lambda. So uh, F equals C divided by lambda. We're going to divide it by lambda on both sides, and that's what you're going to get. So in one of them, you get F is equal to 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by lambda, which is 1 times 10 to the negative 8 really common thing that people might do incorrectly here. Um, either 3 divided by 1 is 3 times 10 to the 8 minus negative 8. So those 8s don't cancel out because you're subtracting negative 8, which gives you 3 times 10 to the 16 hertz. And on the other side, you get F equals 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 1 times 10 to the negative 11, which is 3 divided by 1, so that's 3, times 10 to the 8 minus negative 11, which means 8 plus 11, so 10 to the 19 hertz. So your frequency range is from 3 times 10 to the 16 hertz to 3 times 10 to the 19 hertz. So you, there are some practice sheets uh, that you have that you can take a look at a variety of different situations with these uh, these types of questions, and uh, so this would be a really good time to work on those.